So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Anapanasati. Um, a lot of people understand what Anapanasati is. And this is just an idea I had on the way here because I wasn't sure what to speak about. And uh, so Anapanasati uh, is a Pali word that means basically mindfulness of breathing. And a lot of times when uh, people hear mindfulness of breathing, they, hear, they understand that it's just breath meditation. And it's, it's more than that, uh, and it isn't, in, in two, di two different ways to look at it. I mean, it is, it is breath meditation. It's called mindfulness of breathing. And, but what it does is kind of points out the entire aspect of what happens in a breath meditation, whether we realize it or not, whether we're, we're systematically practicing Anapanasati or not, it, it seems to kind of fall uh, kind of come out the same way. And what I mean by that is it go, we, when we focus on the breath, we use that for a meditation object, there's several different things that happen. And first of all, we're bringing our attention to the body, which, which we all do. I mean, when we sit in meditation, we realize that you know, the, this is the body that got us here to this cushion or chair, wherever. And it's the body that we feel relaxing, and it's the body that part of the body that we focus on. We're focusing, um, you know, on the breath, which is a function of the body. It's the body, uh, uh, you know, the uh, sensation of the body. We're feeling the breath, usually at the nose, you know, in the area of the nostrils and in the area of the sinuses. So we're feeling the breath on the body someplace. And when a person focuses on the breath, it's completely different for everybody. I mean, everybody in this room is probably using it in a different way, which is fine. But it's still using the breath. We're still using the movement of the breath or the sensation of the breath, or we're counting the breaths, or we're you know, doing these different things. But most of it has something to do with the body initially. Now, the, the body, you know, is the, I, I like to call it the gross aspect of who we believe we are, you know, that we are this body or we, we own this body or this body is a part of us in some way, along with the mind. And so in meditation, the, when we, if we focus on the, the body uh, all of the time, it doesn't, seem to work very well for a long duration because it is so gross. In other words, it doesn't allow us to go as deep as we'd like to, to really look at what is arising in our meditation in regards to uh, feelings and moods and emotions and, you know, the, the aspect of the mind, in, including insight. So we start with the body, and then after a while, it's like this is, a, you know, focusing on the body it seems to be like a lot of activity you know, focusing and feeling that sensation. It works really, really well at first, but then after a while, it's like, you know, how long do I have to do this? You know, how long do I have to, to focus on this aspect of the, of the breath? So, and even if we don't plan on changing our meditation object, we start noticing other things kind of coming into the arena of our meditation, and that is usually uh, feelings and f feelings from the Buddhist perspective, um, the Buddhist standpoint is uh, these pleasantness or these unpleasantnesses of our sensations. So we might notice the pleasantness or unpleasantness of the body first of all. We might notice the pleasantness or the unpleasantness of, of the breath. Um, but then that kind of changes. We might notice the pleasantness or unpleasantness of of a sound, you know, nothing, nothing really associated with the body except for the function of hearing, um, you know, and, and as far as our visualizations, if our eyes are closed, we might notice the, the uh, some pleasantness or unpleasantness of, of these images that come up for us. Or even if we're meditating with our eyes open, we might notice the pleasantness or unpleasantness of, of what, we're, what we're focusing on. But primarily the mind, um, this what the Buddha really looked at as the sixth sense, the pleasantness and unpleasantness of of the thoughts and the uh, and these things that come up for us, 
And we start, it's like this is a, a, a bridge between the grossness, you know, this, this function of the body to the aspect of the thinking mind what is pleasant and what is unpleasant in the body, what is pleasant and what is not pleasant within the mind. And we start to uh, really kind of dissect the area of, of experiencing the outer world through the senses and, and the inner world w within. Um, so we can, we can notice pleasant things and unpleasant things out in the world, like sounds and and uh, even thoughts that are related to the outside world. And we can also uh, kind of tune in on the pleasantness and unpleasantness within the body. And that's actually uh, preferable from the, the Buddhist sutras. The Buddhist said that we can feel particularly this, this, this pleasantness and this, this happiness, blissfulness from our meditation practice inside by just allowing the mind to settle down. And he said this is a big part of meditation and something that we should be cultivating. That we should actually be meditating for, for that purpose and use that as a kind of a barometer of whether our meditation is working. Being able to go within and notice this pleasantness that, that happens with us, you know, from allowing the mind to, to settle down. And, and at that aspect, and from that point, the body is not that important in the meditation practice anymore. So all of a sudden we've gone from body, mindfulness of, of body in, in a way, to mindfulness of feelings, which is the aspect of the mind. And we can't really, it's difficult to look at the mind without looking at moods and emotions. Because these moods and emotions are closely linked to this pleasantness and unpleasantness of these feelings. And so we can, we all experience a mood and emotion right now, you know, and it's related to something that is happening. Uh, whether it's internal or external, we, there is a mood or emotion that's happening. And we can actually ask ourselves right now, what, what mood or emotion am I experiencing? And in doing so, we can uh, actually prove to ourselves that we can be very, very mindful in the moment because that is, uh, I, I see it as a really a moment of like pure mindfulness, asking ourselves what are we experiencing, particularly what kind of emotion or what kind of mood, uh, what kind of state are we experiencing right now? And we can ask ourselves that, and we can do it in meditation or, or outside of meditation. You know, this mindfulness um, kind of inquiry, um, and it can be a very, very big part of our meditation practice. So we go from mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, pleasant and unpleasant feelings. Many of them are neutral, so it's kind of tricky. So uh, we can kind of tune in on the feelings that are related to the outside world and then the inside world, and then mindfulness of uh, mind states, or what we could look at as moods and emotions. Um, the the uh, the sutra, when it's translated uh, into uh, English, it's re really pointing at the idea of mind states, these different states that we have, uh, including you know, our level of concentration, our level of, of happiness, our level of, of discontent, our, our level of, of, um, of uh, you know, just basically how we feel. You know, we, we all know what moods and emotions are, but we don't want to confuse that with, with the feelings. And when we sit with these things, we really want to notice that the mind is calming down, first of all, ideally that it's calming down, so that we can become very, very sensitive to these things. And of course, if the mind is you know, doing its crazy stuff that it often does, um, it's difficult to really look at things that are coming up for us, you know, these, these, you know to pinpoint these moods and emotions. And once the mind calms down, then we can, like I said, be very, very sensitive in a good way to these things, and we can notice <clears throat> any kind of uh, uh, truths that come up. And these truths have been, uh, in common language, we call them insights. Uh, we also call this insight practice because of that reason. So insights arise 
not because we're trying for them to, you know, we're not trying to have insights. Um, that would be a, a little bit of a struggle to try for anything in meditation. Um, so, and that's what we're trying to avoid, right? So we want to notice these insights that come up, these truths. And that's exactly how we know that they are insights, because they are truths for us, and not only for us, but for, for everyone. Uh, insights that the Buddha had, he actually built in to the Anapanasati, uh, mind, uh, mindfulness of, of uh, mind objects. And these ob mind objects are insights themselves. And so mindfulness of feelings, mindful, or mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of mind states, moods and emotions, and then mindfulness of mind objects, which are these insights. And the Buddha, as I was beginning to say, used these insights as a part of this actual teaching. And his insights were uh, impermanence, um, how everything uh, is very, very fluid and changing, and uh, for us to notice the impermanence of our thoughts, and permanence of the body and the breathing, and permanence of our feelings, and, and all these things, and just notice the rising and falling continually of, of all of this. And, and the, the, the suffering, the dukkha that can, that can be, be uh, behind um, the, this um, uh, impermanence. So dukkha is that Pali word that means uh, discontent or the stress. And this, this stress, or what some people call suffering, is related to our idea that we can find permanent happiness in an impermanent world. And that's an insight that the Buddha had, and, and he taught that. It was one of his primary teachings all of his life, uh, in his teaching career, if you will. And the, the other insights that he had were that, um, and basically that everything is, is borrowed. You know, everything in the world is uh, so impermanent that it's, it's, it's just very temporary, that we, we, can, um, we, can borrow, uh, we can borrow material things, we can borrow this body, we can borrow ideas, we can borrow uh, everything in this one wonderful world but it's nothing that tangible that we can actually hang on to. And so the conclusion uh, or the, uh, the result of that is that there's not a, not a self that can hang on to any of this. There's not a self that can, can gather all of this up and call it mine. We, we think we can, and the, re the result of that is an uh, e uh, ego situation where the ego feels like we can, we can have this, and we can control this, and we can, um, y you know, we can, we can have these pieces of the world, and we can have this, this wonderful, beautiful body and, and preserve it in such a way. But we can't, you know, and so the Buddha said this is, uh, this is, um, uh, anatta, which is uh, a not the aspect of non-self, that the self isn't powerful enough. There's there's no self that can actually hold on and contain all of these things in such a way that that we feel that it is that like there's a self that is born and a self that dies, and all of this is uh, a very anapanasati is actually. Uh, one of the few meditation teachings that the Buddha did, and the meditation was such a uh, common thing in the Buddha's life, in the life of his monks, and the life of the people that followed him, that it was just kind of common language and common activity for people. And so he didn't really put out a lot of what we would, what we would call today like mindfulness teachings, you know, that, that were put out there just as a mindfulness or a, a meditation-based thing. So Anapanasati uh, was just a, a discourse that he gave before uh, a retreat. So every year when we do this, this retreat, uh, Labor Day retreat that we did, that we were supposed to do this past weekend, I always bring up the Anapanasati and the fact that the Buddha uh, taught very much like we do in retreats these days. The Anapanasati, as, as I said, was delivered to uh, 
uh, of hundreds of people at a at a, a retreat, and he was just reminding people of you know the the, the the meditation practice and how they can use the breath and uh, he went through all these aspects of body feelings mind states and mind objects and so it's something that we can use and and something as I was said in the very beginning something that we we use on a regular basis and sometimes we don't even realize it so we sit in meditation we notice the body we uh, that aspect of noticing changes to the feelings of pleasantness within the body or the unpleasantness uh, and unpleasantness and pleasantness within the mind it goes from these feelings into the mind objects or uh, the the mind states moods and emotions uh, we can take a look at all these things as they rise and fall and the outcome of that or the result of that is insight and um, which is the mind um, mind objects so if you ever have any questions about that please let me know and, and I would like to do a meditation um, based on that uh, there's, there's a lot of information there and uh, of course I'm not going to um, go into detail uh, when I when I got do a little bit of guiding here um, because I it's you know, it's kind of contrary to put all these words out there before we meditate and like get everybody thinking and all that. It's just, it's, it's not, it's contrary to what we want to do in meditation. We want to calm the mind, few words as possible, you know, after I get done spewing these hundreds of words or so that were out there. And um, so I'll be doing some guiding just on the finer aspects of the breath and things to look for, you know, in, within the, uh, the, uh, the makeup of the anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, or what we could call the, the four foundations um, of mindfulness, uh, body, uh, feelings, mind objects, or mind states, and mind objects. So if you want to make yourself comfortable, Just close the eyes. This is likely the first chance that many of us got an opportunity to close the eyes and relax the body and give ourselves permission to to do this practice of meditation many of us probably had an opportunity to meditate maybe this morning that's wonderful but if this is the first opportunity there's probably a little bit of a, a background sigh within the mind thinking that oh this this feels pretty good and so that feeling is probably coming from the body if we've been meditating for a while we notice that the the body is calming we kind of get into that familiar feeling that familiar place of meditation with the body, relaxing the shoulders and the back, the legs. And even the aspect of closing the eyes, when we close the eyes it's like a kind of a sigh of relief, like oh, I can do this, I don't have to keep my eyes open, I don't have to look about, I don't have to be picking up on activity of things I can just close my eyes and go within and so 
the first thing that we notice is the body. Even if we haven't been meditating for, for a number of years or for a long time, we close our eyes and we might notice discomfort in the body if we're not comfortable. I recall when I first med started meditating, I was asking myself it, silently inside if I was doing this right, if my legs are crossed right, or if what, what should I do with my hands, and you know, is my back straight, or maybe I should be sitting in a chair. You know, all these bodily related questions came up. I remember one of the big questions I had was, I wonder if it's okay if I can lean against the couch while I'm sitting on the floor. And then I had the visualization of the Buddha and he was not leaning against the couch while he was sitting in meditation. So we close our eyes and we immediately Notice the body. And then we bring our attention to the breath. We have to pick up a meditation object in order for our meditation to be focused and sound. And the primary object that many people use is the breath. It's a suggested object, actually not only by myself, by, but by the Buddha and many other teachers and saints, meditation instructors. And so focusing on the breath, we can notice the inhalation, we can notice the exhalation. The Buddha mentioned that we can notice the a long breath, we can notice a short breath, we can notice how every breath is different. He talked about how the breath conditions the body. If we breathe in a nice deep inhalation, we can feel energy in the body. And we can work with this. If we want to relax the body in, in, uh, to a certain extent, we can notice the shallowness and the, the evenness, the shortness of the breath, and how the body responds to that. We can notice the, just the exhalation of the breath, which is the most comfortable and relaxing part of the breath. And in doing so, that can be very relaxing for the body. When we think about how the breath can heal the body, and these are some practices of their own, in their own right, it's pranayama practices. Breathing in energy, <clears throat> exhaling relaxation. So the breath can certainly condition the body and the body can condition the breath too. If we are, if we have anxiety in the body, we can feel that in the breathing. If the body is very, very relaxed, the breathing is generally very relaxed and comfortable. So if there's a lot of short, uneven breaths, we can ask ourselves why, and we can ask ourselves what's going on. And so we're talking as if the breath is separate from the body, but actually it's the same. Even the act of activity of breathing is a function of the body. We can be thinking about something completely different than breathing and still be doing breathing quite well. 
the subconscious aspect of the mind allows us to continue breathing whether we think about it or not. And that is one of the reasons why it's so easy for the mind to drift and to wander off. And when this happens, we're told to bring our attention back to the breath. But sometimes the breath can be so comfortable that it, it's almost as if the body is breathing itself. And our focus is very, very light on the breath. And then we notice that the mind is starting to calm down and from the aspect of thinking. While all this is happening, there's a feeling connected to it. There's a feeling happening with the aspect of our visualizations, all the sensations within the body and all the thoughts that we have. If there's a smell in the air, there's a feeling associated with it. If there's a sound, there's a feeling associated So these feelings are pleasant or unpleasant. The pleasant feelings we want more of and the unpleasant feelings we generally want to avoid. They can be worldly ple pleasures and unpleasant things or, or inner non-worldly pleasures and unpleasant things, situations feelings. And so as long as we're moving towards pleasant things and moving away from unpleasant things, there is an aspect of, of the ego or the self that is doing this. So in meditation we want to just simply watch this want to watch our reactions and this is getting into mind, mind states already but first of all we want to pick up on the feelings whether we want more of something or less of something whether we feel something is good or something is bad and in our meditation practice we want to be completely unbiased, but we want to keep an eye on all of this in a non-judgmental way. The rising and falling of these feelings. But the Buddha said that the pleasures that we obtain from meditation practices are the ones that we should cultivate. Because we can find pleasure in just simply watching and noticing these feelings rather than reacting to them. Avoidance or desire moving towards a pleasurable feeling. And closely connected to these feelings, of course, are our mind states the moods and emotions that arise. And we're not too av trying to avoid these things or trying to change them, but again, just being mindful of them. Watching, or better yet, noticing with awareness these different states, these moods. How do we feel at this moment? Do we feel happy? That is a state. Do we feel anxiety? That is a state. These aren't feelings, they're states. 
but in our English language, anything that we can connect with that I feel a certain way is a mind state. I feel love, I feel anger, I feel jealousy. And on and on, I feel desirous. And so we're just simply to watch these things. And the fourth area of the Anapanasati is the mind objects. These can be looked at as insight. They're also called Dharma or Dhamma, the teachings. They don't have to be teachings from another person or teachings from anything that we've read or heard. But these are teachings that we pick up on ourselves from insights, from the truths that arise from our own mind. can be any number of things. And if we're not sure of, a, of what one of these insights may be, we can start with uh, impermanence. Just noticing the rising and falling and the, comp the complete change of everything, the flow of everything as it rises and falls away from our awareness. Everything from the, the body sensations, everything from feelings and moods and emotions to, to every thought that we have. Every material thing, every idea, every person, every everything that has ever been a part of our world is impermanent. But this is beneficial knowledge for us to know because the Buddha said the attachment to all these things is where our suffering comes from. The less attachment that we have, the happier we are, the happier our world is. So we'll sit in silence and please try to use some of this information for the meditation practice. Watching what arises and falls away without attachment.
ง
Please bring your palms together in front of you if you'd like to. May each one of us and all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May we all meet with spiritual and worldly success. And may we have the patience and the courage and understanding to meet and overcome any problems or any difficulties that we might face in life. So the um, Anapanasati is, um, is one way of meditating, really. Um, it's been called insight meditation, you know, because the insights that come about afterward or during and afterwards, that type of thing. And, but it, um, that, that Vipassana word for uh, insight is called Vipassana, or the... Um, the, the Pali word for insight is called Vipassana. And um, Vipassana, it, it, a lot of times people will um, ask me about if, if I teach Vipassana or if this is Vipassana meditation that we do here, or I'll get in, um, emails from people saying that I'm looking for Vipassana you know, meditation place and things like that. Um, and a lot of a lot of times, the, this word of vipassana that people are looking for uh, something that's more related to uh, Gwenka, you know, type meditations. You know, it's these ten, these uh, these free ten day meditations that they do all all over the world. And um, the they call those uh, they're calling those vipassana meditations. And and they are, but they are um, very much, um, uh, for the most part, a shortened version of the Anapanasati. They're because they're working primarily with the body. Um, and my understanding is that it's done for the first uh, first five years for one of the practitioners. And then from, uh, if a person wanted to do an extended retreat, like one of the month retreats, then they start getting into the, the other teachings that we just talked about, you know, the uh, understanding of, you know, the, the feelings and mind states and mind objects. But they first work a great deal with the body, you know, the first step of the four foundations of mindfulness or the Anapanasati. And the... Um, and that really kind of coincides with the way people meditate as well, I think, because uh, I have met people that have worked with their breath and worked with the body for years and years and years, and they like to they stay, you know, right in that area without going into the, the too much uh, cognition-wise the area of the, the feelings and the and the mind and how the and the insights themselves, those kinds of things. So they're using the body, um, and what comes to mind when I when I say that is I've I've met several people that count the breaths, you know, which is a part of the body, and they count the breaths, you know, up to ten or back up to one hundred and back down or whatever, and they they've been doing that for years and years, and it works for them, you know, whatever whatever works, you know, go ahead and keep doing, you know, for the most part, but. Um, you know, keeping that in mind, we also want to get, want to be open to other practices. So, Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, uh, insight meditation, vipassana. You know, this this practice is the primary uh, Theravada Buddhist practice because that's the teachings. You know, that the Buddha actually laid out for us. Um, uh, he taught his monks, and he taught um, taught lay people, you know, to to meditate, you know, using this technique. Um, but that doesn't go. That doesn't mean that there aren't different ways to practice, different uh, styles of practicing. Uh, even the guiding that I put it in with this is something that the Buddha uh, 
didn't do he didn't do guided meditation you know he uh, he gave instructions and then he did the meditation uh, meditation itself um, there's there's probably some situations where the Buddha was giving teachings and you know the people listening the monks and whoever it might be were were meditating while he was teaching. So it was, in, in that respect, it might be kind of like a guided meditation, you know, for them. Um, I don't have any proof of that. I've never read it. I, I'm just assuming that, you know, the people, that's how people are. You know, they, they resonate with a really good teaching or somebody speaking, you know, the truth and, and they close their eyes and they just kind of meditate into it or along with it. And I can only imagine that that happened, you know, with the Buddha when the Buddha was teaching. So, but as far as you know, guided meditation or using sound meditations with gongs and things like that, or you know, even using meditation apps, the Buddha didn't, uh, you know, use any of that. Uh, but we do today. You know, the tools are there, and um, you know, uh, more power to people. You know, to the people. You know, for for using these things guided meditations and um, and in the West you know we have a lots of different styles of meditation in the East there's many many different styles of meditation as well but what I what I was addressing here um, this evening was the Anapanasati and kind of the, the straightforward Theravada Buddhist you know practice um, and you can find uh, more information online. You know, just type Anapanasati, or uh, um, th that would be the best thing to, to to understand Vipassana and insight meditation is to actually look at the Anapanasati teachings. You know, of the Buddha. Um, the the not to promote um, my book or anything like that, but. The mindful, uh, minding the breath is is a book about Anapanasati, and that is about the the Buddhist teaching itself. Nothing, nothing more, nothing, nothing less. Um, and there's there's other books out there as well on the Anapanasati, and um, there's some good information online about it as well. You can get a lot of information. Just look up Anapanasati uh, Sutra or Mindfulness of Breathing Sutra might get you there and you'll get all sorts of information. Good meditation tonight. It was very quiet. Except for my phone, which was turned off. So or it wasn't the phone wasn't turned off, the uh, the sound was turned off, but it, it must something must have kicked it on. I've had that happen before. Any questions or any comments? Any Anything from the, from them, them, their people? No questions, but Maureen joined us. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Uh, I almost know, heard her say. As, as a person who, who, who had pra practiced that 10-day uh, ten, ten retreat uh, with, uh, with Quank, and um, your book, um, Finding the Breath, uh, I, I'm going to plug you. You won't, but I will. <laughs> and uh, having experience in a, in a lot of this stuff, uh, the, 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 your book I found to be very um, practical mm. and um, and easy to follow. There wasn't a lot of complication. And you know, having read other books, you know, and certain writers can just really, you know, mm -hmm. describe things, uh, but. But I found that when I read your book, it, it just it clicked. Mm. So, yeah, thank you. That so was. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very. Uh, uh, if you want to know about the, the, the practice, it's, it's a great book. Yeah, so thank you. The, um, the the sutra, you know, the teaching itself was quite, quite straightforward. You know, from the Buddha, it was, it was really, really a simple teaching, which was really refreshing. And then he kind of. Uh, had liberated and really, really put a lot more into it with the Satipatthana Sutra. Um, and they're the same teachings, but the Satipatthana is just long and lengthy and detailed. And, and um, it's not very, 
conducive like to understand meditation but more un, um, I shouldn't say understand meditation but it's something that you want to read outside of your meditation practice because there's so much there uh, and I suggest everybody read the Satipatthana, you know. Uh, but as far as actually, you know, sitting down and, and, and being able to put these things in the mind and say the, that I'm going to do this practice and, and I'm going to follow these steps, the Anapanasati has everything right there. It's very simple. And uh, I guess it's like that with everything. You know, we can add all sorts of complications and details and blah de blah de blah you know and, and but yeah there's nothing like you know being practical I I think the the teachers I resonate with are, are very practical and you know do you have good meditation? Not too bad. Good. What constitutes a good meditation? Um I think if I can get a at least a couple minutes of of just silence, like without my brain going, I'm usually pretty happy. Yeah, that's good. Not the whole time, but yeah. Well, it's very, yeah. Very few people I've ever heard say, "I I just had 30 minutes of non, uh, no thought, no nothing," you know, unless they were fooling themselves or sleeping or something, you know. Usually, as soon as I notice I have no thoughts, I, I start thinking, yeah. Yeah, this is like, oh, like this I is... Notice, oh, this is so quiet, and it's like, oh, <laughs> wakes up. This is nice not having these thoughts. Whoops, that's a thought, yeah. What constitutes a, what constitutes a bad meditation? Oh, well, let's see. Let me start by saying what a good meditation is, I guess. Ah, okay. That. So, even, like tonight was a very good, very good relaxing meditation, but I did a lot of thinking, I could tell, but I didn't let the thoughts, I didn't do the monkey mind. The thought would come, and I'd go through it a little, maybe for a second or two, and then I would just not get involved in it, not get involved. So even though it wasn't a lot of blanks, sometimes I have more blank time, which is really great, but the second best is having that where I know that I'm doing some thinking, but I know I'm not getting attached to the thinking. And a bad meditation is usually after I've eaten and I start going to sleep. Oh, get tired, yeah. Um, or sometimes if I've had coffee and I'm just really jittery and I can't get, like if I can't get my heart or my breathing to settle down, and it's not a bad meditation, it's just not that. Like tonight, even though I was thinking, it was very, very deeply relaxing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I think the bad meditations are often the good ones. Yeah, I mean, as far as learning the most, sure. yeah. we need bad ones and we need, we need good ones too to keep us going. I mean, if we sat down and... But like, like Terry said, the, the fatigue thing, you know, when you come out of medita out of a meditation and you almost you felt like you're almost asleep all through the whole thing, it's very hard, you know, without that energy, to get to see seem like we get much out of it. Usually, what comes to mind is the bell rings and we go, "That was a waste of time," <laughs> you know, when there is when it's just fatigue, you know. But if it's that if fatigue's not there, then anything goes. It's almost it's like because the bad the bad things we learn from you know it's a period of growth and the good meditations you know they really inspire us to to, to keep at it well I mean when it feels really good you know so so I thank you everybody and we'll see you next week then <laughs>